A dark blue shadow hawk landed to his right. Lurching out of the steam and dust of its landing, the hawk came at him at high speed. Its Armstrong autocannon was pivoted back in transport position, both arms raised above the cockpit. The mech's hands clasped a monstrous steel I-beam, which it must have torn from a nearby structure. For one absurd moment, Chow imagined the battle mech to be an ancient samurai, sword raised above his head to deliver the pear-splitting stroke that would cleave through his enemy's helmet. The instant was frozen in time for Chow as he saw the stroke coming. In a moment of perfect clarity, he knew he could do nothing to avoid it. The I-beam came down on the dragon's cockpit. The Shadowhawk has never really treated me very well. Perhaps it's just poor communication or mismatched expectations, but nevertheless, unlike the other two 55-ton classic 3025 TRO battle mechs, I look at the Shadowhawk with a certain amount of jilted wariness. However, I recognize that many out there have a fondness for it, and I'm nothing if not willing to be fair and give us another shot. So what do you say, Shadowhawk? Shall we give this another go for the sake of the viewers? Look at Janie over there. She'd be heartbroken if we didn't at least try. All right. Let's do this. The story of the Shadowhawk begins on Cave in the middle of the 25th century. This Earth-like planet was one of the first settled by humanity under the Terran Alliance after its temperate climate and breathable atmosphere was identified. Vast industrial complexes were constructed to take advantage of Cave's mineral wealth. One of the companies created, Lang Industries, made its profit through the production of aerospace units and components. As was so often the case, the creation of the first battle mechs rattled the defense industries. Lang's leadership looked at their place in an already cramped aerospace market and decided that they had little to lose by jumping into the battle mech production. The design embraced by its developing engineer, Roger Taylor, was named the Shadowhawk. Much like the Wolverine and the Griffin, the Shadowhawk was intended to be a jack-of-all-trades media mech that could fill a wide variety of roles. Having competition in the market didn't matter at the time as the Terran hegemony was desperate to greenlight every possible design in order to keep their edge on battle mech production following the Lyran commando raid on Hesperus II in 2455, which let the genie out of the bottle. As the other great houses found their own ways to procure battle mech technology, the Terran hegemony was dumping money into commissioned projects like the Lang's Shadowhawk. The SHD-1R weighed in at 50 tons and was built around a 240 primitive fusion engine which allowed the mech to reach 64.5 kilometers per hour on flat ground. While not breaking any records by the Succession War standards, it was swift enough for the first collection of primitive battle mechs. The addition of three jump jets added to the Shadowhawk's maneuverability and 10 standard heat sinks kept the mech relatively cool. 14 tons of primitive plate armor provided 150 points of protection, though armor placement on the 1R would be a continuing issue and actually force a recall of the mech to deal with armor plates snagging on myomer cable and wearing them out. The Shadowhawk's two weapons were a standard medium laser placed into the right arm and an AC-5 autocannon built into the left torso in a unique over-the-shoulder mount that gave the battle mech its signature look. A single ton of ammunition was stored in the same torso as the autocannon. Overall, it's a pretty meager showing of offensive power, but that is the nature of these earliest battle mech designs. As it turned out, the Shadowhawk 1R was a big hit with the Terran hegemony, and later on with upgraded versions sold the Star League. Lang Industries had apparently hit the right mix of needs for mech warriors who appreciated the design, the layout, and the comfort of the cockpit. Besides the previously mentioned recall involving armor plating, the Shadowhawk was an economic and military success in those early years. The fact that Lang Industries continued to produce it for 83 years before the first major upgrade is a testament to that fact. The 1R would end up in the hands of the SLDF as well as the major Intersphere houses as Lang was not locked into an exclusive production deal with the Star League. This will matter as production will eventually branch out beyond their control. The first major upgrade to the Shadowhawk was designated the SHD-2H and would see a full-scale production in 2550. For many, the 2H is the Shadowhawk, as it was what was in the 3025 TRO, and going into the first Succession War, it was the most common variant. The biggest change was a bump up to 55 tons from 50, which opened up some options for newer technology. The 1R's fusion engine was replaced with a Cortec 275 fusion, which bumped the top speed of the Shadowhawk to 86 km per hour. The new movement profile of 583, with the help of a trio of Pitban LFT-50 jump jets, put it on par with its peers. 
The 9.5 tons of armor provided 152 points of protection, which matched the Griffin and the Wolverine. The 12 heat sinks were adequate for general use. The differences between these battle mechs really boil down to weapons loadout and location of ammunition, and that's where things start to get rough for the Shadowhawk. The AC-5 in the left torso is still there along with its one ton of ammunition. The right arm mounted medium laser is there as well. The new additions to this variant were a long range missile 5 rack placed into the right torso along with its one ton of ammunition and a short range missile 2 rack mounted in the open head critical location. The Shadowhawk 2H is one of the best examples of the little bit of everything type build that really hobbles some battle mechs. The presence of full ton blocks of ammunition across all three torso locations drastically increases the likelihood that the mech will suffer from a catastrophic ammunition explosion, if it's in the fight too long rather than being disabled in some other fashion. Overall, the Shadowhawk 2H does a little bit of everything and none of it very well. That being said, the available information suggests the Shadowhawk was a hit among the Star League and House Mech Warriors that piloted it for years. Um, just reporting what I found. Some pointed to the Sparrow 300J life support system installed in the cockpit, which provided superior comfort and quality of life elements that made extended campaigns bearable. Additionally, the mech's hand actuators proved to be dexterous enough for a wide variety of non-combat roles as well, lending to the mech's reputation for always making itself useful. With the collapse of the Star League and the impending First Succession War, some of those Shadowhawks would leave the inner sphere with Kerensky's Exodus fleet, but that's another story. Those that remained in house armies were quickly put to use by the Great Houses, unleashing their arsenals against each other. The Draconis Combine and Federated Sons found themselves dealing with a significant issue as they were cut off from repair parts for their Shadowhawks and were unlikely to buy new ones produced. Each ended up investing heavily in their own production lines and variants. Follow me, Gabby said, and set his Shadowhawk into a run toward the south wall. The impact of the mech's footfalls jarred his tailbone even through his seat padding. The hawk had a gait like a mule. No shadow hawk he'd ever been in had a smooth ride at running speed, but red-tailed hawk was worse than most. The first significant variant beyond one-of-a-kind field refits was the Shadow Hawk 2D. Now, if you thought the Federated Sons would approach a variant of the Shadowhawk in a calm and rational way, perhaps even leaning into the autocannon with an upgrade to an AC-10, oh, you would be hilariously wrong. At some point, the decision was made to construct a version of the Shadowhawk which could hide until close to a target, leap out for an alpha strike, and then run off before taking off too much return fire was made, and no one was around to point out the flaws in this. Designed by committee, I suspect. It would start showing up the ranks in the AFS in 2796. An astonishing five tons of armor was removed from the 2H to make room for additional weaponry. Now you might be thinking, mech frog, sure they made it into a glass cannon, but at least it's a cannon now, right? To that I say, I'm sorry, today is just going to be a day full of disappointment for you. Besides two additional heat sinks, the 2D was given a second SRM2 placed into the center torso, and the shared single ton of ammo was moved to the left side torso. A second medium laser was added to the mech on the left arm, and that's it. While this does on paper look like a boost in DPS, in practice the Shadowhawk 2D has the armor of a light mech with the punch of, well, a 40 ton mech. If I'm being a little too subtle here, this is a bad design. As the First Succession War really got going, the Draconis Combine was feeling the pressure on its logistics lines on the Davion border. The Shadowhawk 2K variant developed and first produced in 2803 reflects that in a much more energy-focused layout. The Combine kept the LRM-5 because it is of course the most important weapon of the bunch, and replaced the rest of the weapons with a PPC in the left torso weapons mount and 5 additional heat sinks, bringing the total to 17. Though this variant is sometimes referred to as a Griffin knockoff, it was completely heat neutral even while leaping its full jump distance. The 2K retains the 9.5 tons of armor, which is good, but only being able to produce 15 heat max during a turn means two heat sinks are wasted unless you're fighting while standing next to a stream of lava while eating ghost pepper Doritos. What this loadout desperately calls out for is dropping two heat sinks and adding a second other M5, which could share that one ton of ammo from the first. It would mimic the Griffin, but at least you wouldn't have unused heat sinks. Both the 2D and the 2K are really rough in their attempts to improve upon an already lackluster Shadowhawk. As we move down the timeline, let's hope things get a little better for our jack-of-all-trades 55-tonner. 
Likely the most famous Shadowhawk in existence during the Succession War years has to be the one owned by Grayson Carlisle in the Grey Death Legion. Though Grayson would only pilot the mech in a few instances before upgrading to his infamous Grey Marauder, the mech itself is often referred to glowingly in battle reports. The descriptions, sometimes bordered on the absurd, is that shoulder-mounted autocannon was described as intimidating and powerful. I suppose there's always some leeway given for artistic license here, but it is an AC-5. Three, we're gonna need that ace gun of yours, he said quickly. The Shadowhawk mounted an Armstrong III autocannon, a rapid-fire projectile weapon that combined superior accuracy and striking power. There might be bigger autocannons available in the inner sphere, but few systems were better overall. And right now, Alex was counting on accuracy rather than brute force to take this trick. Now as we run roughshod toward our Helm Memory Core upgrade version of the Shadowhawk, I'm unsure if it's a genuinely good upgrade or just that now we've been conditioned to expect bad ones by this point, so even a modest effort is looking like a big win. Either way, the Shadowhawk 5M arrives to save the day in 3048 thanks to the engineers at Earthworks on Callaway 6. By this point in the timeline, there were a couple of manufacturers of older 2H Shadowhawks, but even the Davions and Combine had moved on to other designs. The 5M was an opportunity to take the aging mech and inject some life into it. I'd say they did an okay job of it. The redesign took advantage of Endo Steel and a Hermes 275XL engine which bought a considerable amount of weight in exchange for those precious internal locations and a more vulnerable engine. The 5M carries 10 double heat sinks instead of 12 singles, which buys a couple of extra tons of mass as well. So what do we get with all this saved weight? Oh boy, let's get into it. The first upgrade was a modest one, but always appreciated. The Maximilian 43 standard armor plate was increased to 10.5 tons from 9.5, boosting the total armor to 168 points. While not maxing out on the total possible armor on a 55 ton mech, it's still nice to see the investment. The Shadowhawk 5M was given five jump jets, which pushed the movement profile up to a 585, which improves the overall mobility and helps the mech come closer to hitting that goal of being a jack of all trades machine. The AC-5 autocannon in the left torso is upgraded to an Ultra AC-5 variety, and the single ton of ammunition was given case to limit damage from any ammunition explosions. The medium laser in the right arm remains as it was, though the SRM-2 in the head was upgraded to the Streak variety. The ammunition was placed in the center torso. Finally, the biggest leap in power came from the replacement of the LRM-5 launcher with an LRM-20 in the right torso, along with a single ton of ammunition. Even though it had just six shots, the fourfold increase in damage potential is appreciated for a traditionally underpowered battle mech. There is case in the right torso for the LRM ammo, though it probably isn't needed as those LRMs are going to go quickly. Overall, the 5M is the first of the Shadowhawk variants that I would be willing to take into battle. It finally has the power to make it dangerous to others, and the mobility with the five jump jets is stellar. Apparently, the Federated Commonwealth agreed with me as they purchased many of the 5Ms as they rolled off the Earthworks assembly line. Some ended up with militia units, while others were resold to friendly mercenary units. The Free Worlds League military also snapped up their fair share of 5Ms before Earthworks retooled their production lines for a newer variant. My only hesitation with the design falls to that streak SRM-2 ammunition in the center torso, which is a significant risk for the duration of the fight unless the mech warrior dumps the ammunition at the first scent of trouble. Unlike the LRM-20 ammunition, going through 50 shots of streak SRM ammunition would be incredibly unlikely in all but the longest campaigns. The limited damage output of the launcher makes for a liability without substantial reward. Now, as with previous videos, where we cover mechs with a lot of variants, we're not going to be able to cover them all here in this shorter form format. If I miss your favorite, attribute it to deliberate malice on my part. Stepping up just a couple years down the timeline, I want to call attention to the Shadowhawk C, which is the clan refit of the Shadowhawk intended for second line units and Salama mech warriors. Built off the 2H chassis, it maintained the 583 movement profile and still has just 12 single heat sinks and 9.5 tons of standard plate armor. The upgrade to the mech was entirely limited to the weapons loadout. The medium laser in the right arm is upgraded to the clan ER medium, which made the mech more powerful at 15 hexes. The LRM-5 was swapped with the clan version, and the SRM-2 was upgraded to a streak. Finally, the autocannon in the left torso was upgraded to a clan LB-5X AC, which allowed for flexibility in firing solid rounds or cluster shot. 
Overall, the Shadowhawk C is solid and an example of just how clan weapon upgrades can make a big difference to the overall power and viability of a loadout. It's also one of the few mechs that fields an LB5X, which is nice to see in play. If you're running a game in 3050 where you run into some second line clan forces, this might be a fun mech to throw into their ranks. In 3054, we receive an Operation Sneaky Sneak variant of the Shadowhawk with the 5S. This variant is actually a post-production refit that was offered to some select clients who bought a 5M. Equipped with a variety of electronic warfare items and energy weapons, the 5S was intended for scouting and high-value item retrieval operations behind enemy lines. The biggest change for the 5S was the larger 330XL fusion engine, which pushed the max movement profile up to a 695. It was a significant weight investment, but that speed increase was part of the max plan for survival. Move quickly and avoid being caught. The 11.5 tons of armor maxes out the protection, and interestingly, the distribution favors the legs more with the 5S, presumably to reduce the likelihood of a lucky shot disabling the mech's leg actuators. The ammunition-based weapons were all pulled in favor of a collection of lasers, the most powerful being a standard large laser in the right arm. Backing it up in the mid and short range were four standard medium lasers split evenly between the left and right torsos, and a medium pulse laser was installed in the left arm. It all adds up to a powerful alpha strike that is sustainable thanks to 13 double heat sinks. At a full run and firing, the 5S only ends at plus two heat into the red, which is admirable for an all energy build that can do up to 34 damage. In addition to the weapons, the Shadowhawk 5S carries target acquisition gear to assist artillery fire support, as well as a Guardian ECM system and a Beagle active probe to both hide from and seek out threats. Finally, the 0.5 tons of remaining mass was reserved for an empty head critical location for cargo. This could be anything from items to people if necessary, and it provides some mission flexibility should the Shadowhawk need to bring something back in one piece. It's a great mech to use if you're running a Destiny campaign. The 5S is one of those few Shadowhawk variants that I really like. Even if you don't use it as a deep cover special ops scout, it's still a decent 55 ton brawler mech. I definitely give it a much coveted mech frog recommendation. Now, strolling down the timeline a bit, our next notable variant is the Shadowhawk 5D, which showed up on the scene in 3066. This variant was a joint effort by engineers from Callan Industries, Earthworks Incorporated, and the Vicor Group, which wanted to update the Shadowhawk with newer technology. Similar to the 5M, Endo Steel would make up the core structure of the design. However, a standard 275 fusion engine was retained in order to make the mech hard to bring down on the front lines. Some weight was made up with 9.5 tons of ferrofibrous armor which provided additional protection over earlier Shadowhawks. It also completely changed the mech's physical appearance in a much more streamlined look. 10 double heat sinks were added to keep the mech cool which it could under most normal use. The 5D's most notable change was the installation of a rotary AC5 autocannon into that left torso. The weapon had the capability of producing a tremendous volume of fire and damage on the target, with the caveat that it has just two tons of ammunition to bring an end to any dispute. 40 shots might seem like a lot, but it can go quickly with that rotary autocannon. Backing up the Rack 5 were a pair of standard medium lasers split between the arms and a Streak SRM-4 launcher placed in the head critical slot. Its one ton of ammunition is stored in the left torso along with case which could protect it and the autocannon reloads. Overall, your opinion on the Project Phoenix Shadowhawk is likely going to boil down to how you feel about that Rack 5. If you're a fan of its gimmick and are comfortable with the risk involved in going all out on a target when the opportunity arises, it could be a solid choice for your Lance. If you're a more conservative player, there are probably better options to fit your risk-reward profile. Unsurprisingly, the 5D was popular among the forces of the Federated Sons, who eagerly added it to their cavalry units. It has also been spotted among mercenary units with connections to the Davions and the AFFS. Moving from a stroll to a jog down the timeline, our next stop is in 3079 with the Shadowhawk 8L for really no reason at all. It definitely won't be immediately apparent once you look at the loadout. Taking advantage of Endosteel, an XL engine, and improved jump jets, the 8L has a movement profile of 587. This pretty much guarantees that whenever I use it, jumping will be the primary method of moving from point A to point B. 10 double heat sinks keep the mech relatively cool, and the 9.5 tons of standard plate aren't a surprise. 
The interesting loadout begins with the addition of a plasma rifle on the left torso along with two tons of ammunition. It can hit hard for 10 damage and applies that 1d6 heat to targets that carry heat sinks. For infantry, battle armor, and other non-heat synced units, the plasma rifle does its 10 damage plus an additional 2d6 damage in 5 point groupings. In the right arm, a medium variable speed pulse laser could provide a solid secondary punch in the short range. A multi-missile 5 launcher was placed into the right torso along with 2 tons of ammunition which definitely helps the mech be a problem at all ranges. Finally, the mech is geared with a Guardian ECM suite and a Beagle active probe, helping the mech really stand out as a medium scout. Overall, the Shadowhawk 8L really shines as a testbed for newer technology without getting too crazy with adding specialized armor or other bells and whistles. It has just enough to push you a little bit. So if you're looking for a newer Shadowhawk that doesn't go too far off the rails, check out the 8L. Now we're gonna hit two more official variants today and the first arrives on the battlefield in 3097. In an effort reflecting some of that cooperation between a periphery state and an inner sphere entity, the Magistracy of Canopus and Rim Commonality teamed up to produce the Shadowhawk 7H. As an aside, the Free Worlds League, come on, get your act together. You've dumped your purse all over the inner sphere and we really do need to clean it up. Purple bird, strong and all, but sheesh. Now the Shadowhawk 7H benefits from Endosteel and a 275 light fusion engine. With a top speed of 86 kilometers per hour, the addition of five jump jets pushes that movement profile of the mech to 585. No surprise there. 10 double heat sinks and 10.5 tons of standard armor plating are nothing unusual at this point. The major updates are found in the loadout, starting with the iconic shoulder-mounted autocannon, which has been upgraded to an LB-10X and given two tons of ammunition. An enhanced LRM-5 in the right torso provides a modest damage potential even at close range. The traditional medium laser in the right arm is upgraded to the ER variety, and finally, maybe because they forgot about it, the SRM-2 is still in the head critical hit location. In a move I thoroughly approve of, all of the ammunition was moved to the right torso so that it could be protected by Case 2. Overall, I like the upgrade to the LB-10X. It's the autocannon that the mech really should have had from the beginning, which would match the way it's described in the lore as a weapon that could be feared and respected. The SRM-2 is a bit of an afterthought, and those two tons could have been used on an additional ER medium laser and a heat sink, or even a medium pulse laser, and been far more effective. Alas, we can't get everything we want, so in the meantime, the 7H is a solid contender if you're playing in the Dark Age and beyond. Our last official Shadowhawk on this list is the newest of the bunch in the timeline. Brought to us by Callan Weapons Industries in 3141, the Shadowhawk 6D has a couple of new bells and whistles worth covering. Again, Endosteel is employed, though this time the standard 275 engine remains. Five jump jets help maintain the 585 movement, which has become the standard for the 55-tonner classic. Eleven double heat sinks were installed along with 9.5 tons of ferrofibrous armor. Now, the star of the show for the Shadowhawk 6D is the re-engineered laser. This variant carries a large version in the left torso in place of the traditional autocannon and a medium version in the right arm. For the uninitiated, the re-engineered laser was an attempt by the Federated Sun's engineers to mimic the high power damage output of a clan heavy laser technology, but mixed with the pulse laser technology to make it more accurate. The experiments were largely a failure except for a slight improvement in accuracy, and one of the designs apparently had the quirk of being able to completely negate the anti-energy weapon properties of specialty armors like reflective, ferrolamellar, and hardened armor plating. Seeing the potential for significantly degrading the defensive capabilities of more advanced mech designs, the Federated Suns put the laser into production. The Shadowhawk 6D's large re-engineered laser does 9 damage to standard armor out to 15 hexes at a minus 1 to hit, but it also does that 9 damage to hardened plate, which would normally absorb 2 points of damage for every point marked off on the record sheet. So that large re-engineered laser would actually be doing the equivalent of 18 damage to the section protected by the hardened armor. The reason why the Federated Sons were so excited about this weapon was that the Draconis Combine were particularly fond of hardened armor and were placing it on their new battle mechs like the Shiro, the Rokurokubi, and the Narukami. I'm sure the prospect of imagining the look on some smug DCMS mech warrior's face as his or her mech's armor melted away was too tantalizing to pass up. Looking at the combination of the two lasers on the 6D, if both hit, it would be the equivalent of 30 damage on a hardened armor target. Seeing the appeal now? Backing up the two lasers, an MML-5 rack was placed into the right torso along with two tons of ammunition, protected by Case 2. 
Finally, a one-shot streak SRM-2 was placed in the head, critical location. Overall, the 6D is a deceptively powerful battle mech when used against the appropriate targets. When deployed on a raid on Palmyra in an attempt to rescue some AFFS personnel, a Davion force that included multiple Shadowhawk 6Ds was intercepted by a DCMS company at the drop site. Though the mission was unsuccessful, the ferocity and durability of the 6D surprised the Combine warriors, who thought they were going to have an easy time mopping up the relatively light raiding force. Of particular note, the presence of Case 2 prevented catastrophic damage and several ammunition explosions. Though it didn't have the opportunity to really take advantage of the re-engineered lasers, the durability of the Shadowhawk shined through as a Grand Dragon and two Panthers fell before the Davion forces made their escape. Only one Shadowhawk was lost in return due to a through-armor gyro hit. If you know an opponent who's inclined to run mechs with fancy newfangled armor types, the Shadowhawk 6D could be a great trump card to play to humble them a little bit. With the pilot momentarily dazzled, Grayson urged his Shadowhawk forward in a lumbering run. Too late, the Centurion's autocannon shifted its aim. Grayson's hawk swept past the upraised weapon and cannonballed into the lighter mech with a clang of impacting armor that rang in Grayson's cockpit like the unbearable clangor of an enormous bell. Both mechs went down in a tangle of arms and legs. The only way Grayson could strike back was hand to hand. He closed his hawk's left hand into a steel fist that drove with explosive force into the right side of the centurion's head. Armor that could absorb or refract millions of joules of laser power was hard-pressed to deflect the kinetic energy of such a blow. The centurion's armor plate buckled, and its neck traverse bearings groaned. Grayson struck again and again. Now I hope you didn't think you were going to get away without a MacFrog variant. Just a reminder, this is a completely non-canon and entirely for fun build. Technically, it's a mixed inner sphere clan tech design, though only one clan piece of technology was added. It has inner sphere endosteel, a light fusion engine, and 10.5 tons of light ferrofibrous armor, providing the weight savings necessary for a pretty hefty shoulder-mounted weapon. The movement profile is a traditional 585, so no weird things going on there. 11 double heat sinks are adequate for typical use, only pushing into the red with alpha striking and jumping on the same turn. 1MF's primary weapon is a Hyper Assault Gauss 20 in the left torso. This long-range rifle can humble even heavy and assault mechs quickly if ignored for too long. Backing it up is an Inner Sphere Streak SRM-6 in the right torso and an Inner Sphere ER Medium Laser placed in the right arm. Finally, the traditional Emotional Support ER Small Laser is placed in the head critical hit location. The HAG-20 has two tons of ammunition, which is a slight drawback, so make those 12 shots count. The single ton of SRM ammunition is stored in the left torso along with the HAG-20 so that the Case 2 installed can do its thing to protect the mech from any unplanned explosive events. Overall, I see the Shadowhawk 1MF as a complementary lancemate to other swift medium mechs as a big gun in the situation. If I can get in close and employ those streak SRM-6s and the HAG-20 to good effect, it's going to be a powerful mech hunter. So why do we love the Shadowhawk? Of the three classic 55 tonners, this is the one that is the toughest for me. The 2H is a mess of a loadout, and the first few refits really struggle to improve upon it. However, the helm upgrades, specifically the 5M, do go a long way towards redemption and help the Shadowhawk meet its original goal of being an agile, multi-use design that can be a pain for enemies at all ranges. Now, I know it has its fans out there, so I hope my commentary didn't come off as too harsh. The Shadowhawk is a legendary old-school mech that benefits greatly from a great look that precedes Battletech entirely. While it won't be my go-to pick in most occasions, it's still nice to have that option. For those who love it, just keep loving it. Thank you so much for coming out as I blathered on about Battletech today. If you enjoy the video and feel that it's worthy, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons so that the YouTube algorithm smiles upon me. To those who go the extra step to become channel members, you rock and I appreciate it. Even a modest membership goes a long way to keeping this all running. So until we meet again, take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.